advising clients across the country. Here he is, your host, Jay Christopher Boyd. Welcome back to Something More with Chris Boyd. I'm Chris Boyd, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner here with Jeff Perry. And we have a returning guest who's been away for a little while. We're joined by Brian Regan, our firm's Chief Investment Officer. Brian, great to have you on the show. Hi, everybody. I'm still alive. <laughs> it's good yeah, to have I'm you. So <laughs> lots to talk about. And um, with, um, you know, before we get started, I, I meant in the uh, prior segment to reference uh, some resources that we have. Um, if you're dealing with questions relating to your retirement, uh, we have a great little guide. Uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit and where to find that. It's a retirement resource guide. I guess it's intended for people uh, thinking about retirement, approaching retirement, but it's certainly a good review and information for those in retirement already. It's on our website, which is amrfinancial.com. Once you get to the website, go to the resources tab, click that, and you'll see resources and you'll see the a couple of them down there but the one we're talking about today is the retirement resources guide click that and you can get a free copy complimentary copy of the guide and it will ask you a lot of questions for you to think about and many of those questions will lead you to doing some homework and hopefully make you more prepared or more comfortable in your retirement and just generally speaking if you find you're dealing with some of these kinds of questions don't hesitate to reach out to us at amr uh, as you deal with your financial planning or portfolio questions, uh, we're a resource. We're happy to meet with you. We offer a complimentary consultation, and you're welcome to take us up on that uh, by reaching out to us through our website, amrfinancial.com, or you can give us a call, 508-771-8900. All right, so where should we begin with Brian um, here, Jeff? We got where do we to, start? to so talk at, about. I know. We're at the end of the second quarter. Um I'd love to hear his initial, I, I know the numbers are still kind of settling in. It takes a little bit for numbers to settle in. So I don't, I don't want to get into that, but just kind of a general impression of where we find ourselves. And I also wanted to pose the question, um, I'll, I guess I'll frame it like this. You know, if, for those individuals like myself who happen to watch the financial news and the talking heads, and, you know, do different webinars and listen to experts, quote unquote experts. That's really someone from out of town carrying a briefcase in many cases. But, right. Right. <laughs> you know, there's, there's been this uh, kind of storyline of the recession's coming, the recession's coming. And they use their, um, you know, they use the fact that the Fed's been tightening. They've been rising, having raising short term interest rates and. There's a lot of things going on in the world with Russia and Ukraine. And there's a lot of reasons why people can say the economy is slowing down or going to slow down. Inflation is one of them. And therefore, ultimately, we're going to have a recession. But I've been kind of counter to that, kind of um, watching, watching corporate earnings, which have been, in my view, pretty good. Watching consumer behavior, retail sales factory sales, factory production, productivity, pretty good. And then this past week, we saw the final numbers for the uh, GDP for the first quarter was actually up 2% as compared to the initial report of 1.3%. And the market's doing pretty good. So, you know, where's the recession? That's that's how I'm feeling this week, Brian. Welcome back. <laughs> nice to have you. Thanks, Where Jeff. is it? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I agree with you. Um, you know, I don't think, I don't think me and you, we spent a lot of time on the radio together. I don't think we ever said that we were sure that there was going to be a recession. No, um, not at all. I think, I do think that was certainly the consensus and, you know, I want to, I want to bring it back to this conversation back maybe six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, six months ago, we did our, our quarterly webinar for the, you know, the end of 2022, the beginning of 2023. It's, um, usually an important one, you know, you kind of review what's happened in the last year. And in that webinar, I reviewed what happened in the last year, you know, the pandemic economy. And when we did that, we realized that we realized two things. One, the economy is starting to normalize, right? We, we, had, mm -hmm. we had a boom when, uh, you know, there was a surge in government spending, uh, people were buying goods left and right. 
Uh, then we had shortages because nobody was working, nobody was producing anything. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it's gradually gotten to be to be more normal. Um, so we, it, it was kind of unclear, you know, how the economy was going to react, you know, in, in, in this normalization. I, I think it was anyone's guess. Um, and as the as monetary policy tightened, I think it was the general assumption that they weren't going to stick the landing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's some good historical reasoning for that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's not like it was completely, you know, um, out of thin air. Uh, but, you know, we've been promised a recession for, for 18 months now. Uh, and it just, it just hasn't happened. Um, you know, I think, I do think it was partially, uh, you know, politically motivated. We, we did have an election cycle during that time. Um, as, as most things are these days, which is, which is sad. Um, you know, I don't think we should ever, ever root for a recession and we should always root for, for sticking the landing. Um, and but just before you move on from that, I have noticed that, um, Lizanne Saunders for one of Schwab seems to talk about the idea of a rolling recession, uh, you know, different sectors have been hit with some disruption along the way, but it's not been this like all out recession uh she doesn't she hasn't said that definitively but do you think there's a merit to that concept yeah i think it's very clear uh, i you know i think financial services last year um certainly had a, a probably had a recession right if you think about the the boom that happened in uh, investment banking activity just around SPACs, for example and ipos uh that that went to zero um you know in the investment management industry uh, a lot of us are paid on um you know assets under management and that obviously went down as the markets sold off. Uh, so, you know, that for financial services definitely definitely took it on the chin a little bit. Uh, you know, in the in the technology industry, a lot of these companies are paid, uh, uh, a lot of the employees are paid in stock, uh, and companies were very cognizant of, uh, you know, share dilution last year. Um, and they, you know, started started cutting heads for the first time in probably 20 years. So that, you know, that, that, that hit too. Um, the interesting thing, you know, when it comes to a rolling recession is as, as technology services started cutting, uh, I think financial services probably started coming back a little bit, you know, to, to the rolling recession idea. Um, and then there's like this, there was kind of false recessions or false narratives. And that's a big, big uh, theme in my uh, investor insights letter this, this quarter about false narratives. And I think that, you know, the housing market is, was an interesting false narrative. The narrative, uh, you know, maybe a year ago was with rising interest rates, hmm. the housing industry had to suffer. And the reality is that there is a shortage of homes, uh, both demographically, there's a shortage of homes and right. also people not wanting to give up their interest rates as a shortage of homes. And the home builders have done exceptionally well. So, you know, that's a, that, that has been a false narrative. Um, you know, construction jobs are still moving higher, uh, which is interesting as well. So there's some truth to the rolling recession. There's some, you know, phantom rolling recessions um, that happen. Uh, but yeah, I think I think there's there's definitely some some you know interesting points there. Uh, one of the you know reasons why people thought there would be a recession, I think this is a good one, and I still think this is um, you know one of the reasons why you know, a, a strong wind could push us into a mild recession is that we, the assumption was that we were at full employment. And the reason why people thought we were at full employment, and perhaps we were under the certain circumstances, was because wages were rising very, very rapidly, and people could not hire. Um, and what we have seen, and, you know, anecdotally, I think we all experienced that. And the odd thing is what we've seen is more people come into the labor force. Uh, it was slow, to come back to the pre-pandemic levels. And now we've shot well past that. And I think that was a little surprising to people for a variety of reasons. Uh, a big one being retirements, right? We assume that uh, baby boomers would, would start retiring in mass and it seems like they did. And then we're enticed back into the market, um, either out of necessity or out of greed, you know? The greed well, it could, the, it, it could I, be I, infl I, inflation too, right? I mean, people, their budgets could have become tighter and if wages are up it's more enticing to say let's let's go to work sure uh, it's certainly possible i think there's i think you can point to a whole variety of reasons so uh we've actually seen calming down in the in the way uh, wage growth uh you mm -hmm. know back to kind of normalized levels and by by some measures um and at the same time all inflation measures have really turned on a dime um you know that really started uh, six to nine months ago uh it really started a, a year ago 
um, but became very obvious six to nine months ago. And interest rates have reacted to that. I don't mean the Fed funds rate. I mean, longer term interest rates, they mm-hmm. have been static. You know, the 10 year hit about 4.2%. Today, it's ranges, you know, between 3.6 and 3.8%. Um, but it, the the lack of volatility has been um, you know very very good for risk assets, and that uh, I believe is a in direct relation to to what's happening with inflation, where we're, it's finally becoming obvious um, that this two to three year cycle of inflation that we're in is coming to an end. I, I think it's already come to an end. It just really has to flow through through to the data, and the Federal Reserve will you know react as the data comes in. Um, and I think the you know if you look at the if you look at the markets that that's that's what the market believes right now that the the Fed isn't going to raise much more, um, but that you know they're probably not going to cut very much either um, at least over the next year. You think the uh, Fed's comments that uh, came out a week or two ago I think it was last week I've lost track of time but um, where there was the um, impre- given the impression that there very well may be more rate hikes in the near future. Do you think that was intended more as an effort to uh, position the market um, as uh, as compared to the reality of the likelihood of a, a rate increase? Yeah, I, I do. I agree with that, Chris. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's possible they could do 25 basis points again, but I just don't see the need. Um, yeah. I think they've done a good job and it's time to stick the landing. I, you know, there's, a lot of, you know, the common, the common theme or consensus is that rate hikes take 12 to 18 months to play out into the true economy, which means we're right. nowhere, we're nowhere near feeling the, the you know, month yeah. of this. So, you know, it's, it is still very, that's another good reason why we could have a recession in the future. We're just, we're just in the infancy of the slowdown and that we're having in the economy. And, and, and let's be clear, it is very much a slowdown because we were screaming two years ago. The economy was on a seven, eight, nine percent pace, if, if you remember, on a, on, a, on a real basis. I mean, it was shockingly high. So now we're back to kind of normalized levels, which is good. Um, but it is very possible that we continue to slow down as, as the effects of these interest rates um, come in. I, I'm kind of of the mind that the economy reacts a lot quicker uh, in the 21st century than maybe it had in the past. For a variety of reasons, but mostly because we're a digitally connected economy. Um, so you know that's just that's just my thought anecdotally. I, I don't you know I, there's not there's not academic research here. It's just it seems like everything's moving a little faster. So why wouldn't why wouldn't the economy reaction to interest rates move a little faster? That's so you know, that is um, that's that's hopeful. Uh, the banking crisis i don't believe is over i think what the federal reserve did um by you know lending at par for one year uh really put a floor on it uh, under the 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 immediate crisis that we were having with silicon valley bank um first republic and 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 uh signature bank um but i do think you know there could be a looming crisis in commercial real estate now that's a sl- very very slow moving crisis so this isn't a prediction by any by any um, stretch of the imagination. And the reason why it's a slow moving crisis is because uh, maturities of debt are staggered. They're usually five to 10 years. Um, and and leases can off also for office buildings be, be 10 years. And commercial real estate's a very broad subject. And what I really mean is, is, is office space. Um, but there's a lot of regional banks that hold this office space that we know for sure is not as valuable as it was pre-pandemic. Um, so that is, you know, they own the debt on it and they're secured. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. If you talk to, you know, a regional banker, I'm sure what they would say is, you know, this is 50% loan to value. Um, we're very well covered. This, there's no threat of us losing money on this loan. Um, but, you know, if you use some common sense, you'll see that there's definitely, uh, there's definitely more capacity uh, in the in the office real estate space than there certainly was you know four years ago, uh, so that's something I think is very much worth keeping an eye on, and I think it could be you know savings and loan crisis 2.0, um, but at least in the near term, that seems like the Federal Reserve put a floor under it. So Brian, you're making the distinction. You're talking about regional and smaller banks. I'm sure you saw this week in the that the Fed did their, um, I don't know how often they do it, but the big stress test of the 
largest banks in the United States, and they all did very well, according to the news reports anyway. So you're drawing a distinction between the big money center banks, the big commercial banks, and these regionals, correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the big money center banks are, are, you know, should be more powerful than they ever have been um, mm -hmm. because they kind of have an implicit guarantee, right, from 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 the market at the at the very least. Where it's, if deposits flow out of these small banks from fears, it's going to move into you know the larger banks. So you know that I've I've said before, and I still believe this that the way that you should Evaluate a bank is not on net interest, net interest margin, but it should be on deposit growth and state in the stickiness of deposits. I think uh -huh. that it's a common um, misunderstanding on how to evaluate banks. Going off of your uh, staying on the banking subject, do you think one of the reasons that the Fed, Federal Reserve paused on the interest rates are not to put additional pressure, meaning higher short term rates on the regional banks, which might make those cracks a little bit larger how we have higher rates well it, it could be um mm -hmm. but i i just don't think they need to <laughs> i mean there's to me there's no inflation right but that's because i am adjusting for the measurements that take a year or two to right. throw. you know one of the big ones that people like to talk about uh right now is you know auto insurance so this is a good example of how we're still feeling the effects of the pandemic if you remember what happened during the pandemic, people weren't driving. So right. what did auto insurers do? They slashed rates. They gave people credits. In some right. cases, I remember them giving checks to people. Right. It is inevitable that when that's the situation you're going from to going to uh, then again, going through a supply shortage, then going to kind of normalization, that you're going to have an increase in auto insurance rates. But that is really based on the pandemic effects, right? So mm -hmm. next year, it's very unlikely that that's going to continue to happen, right? So you, to me, you discount that. Um, we're still seeing significant increases in rents in the CPI report, but we know from real-time data that, that in the majority of the country, that's that's deflationary right now, That not even disinflationary, deflationary, that the rates are actually negative for the first time, I think, since since they've ever measured it. Um, you know, certainly not the case here in Boston, but these are these are you know, national, um, national measurements, right? So, right. you know, certain regions are doing better than others. So I think that's, that's very clear right now. Uh, you had mentioned the idea of normalized uh, numbers when it came to the GDP and some employment, I think, stats. But uh, Jeff, you had wanted to talk a little bit about some of the news of the week as it relates to some of those details. Yeah, you know, when I was kind of thinking about it, leading up to the show recording today talking about where where is the recession i was thinking about the employment numbers that have been very strong and even this past week i, I don't have the top of, on the top of my head the numbers but the expectation was about 260 odd thousand new claims and it was 230 thousand it was uh 30 thousand plus or minus less than anticipated and the number of continuing claims hasn't really budged so you know, you mentioned more people entering the, the workforce, but the overall inflation rate, if you will, is still very low compared to historical measures. You mean the unemployment rate? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree. But yeah. I think what we're learning is that full employment under normal circumstances in the United States economy is lower than what previous people previously assumed. Yeah, we used to think it was around five, right? That's obviously not the case, right? right. I mean, we're at three point six percent today. Yeah, uh, we're three point seven percent. We're seeing and still seeing people coming to the labor force, um, which is remarkable, right? Well, we we used to have a bigger labor force too. You know what I mean? So maybe that's you know varying aspects, right? On the one hand, you had more people in it. You mean more participation? Yeah, yeah. As a participation rate, yeah, right, I think. right. Oh, I don't have the numbers on the participation rate, but you do have more people in the actual labor force. Yeah, too. the aggregate, you're right. right. It's the actual day, but but as a percentage of... Um, right. yeah, but I think yeah. what you're saying, Chris, is actually a real problem. I'm kind of saying, you know, we have, this is a good good thing, right? That more people are coming in, but I think... Well, the, you, baby, the baby boomer generation is retiring or retired and they're living longer 
right? So they are slowly, if they're not already out, the graying of America is happening, right? So when you look at the yeah. the overall numbers of people working in Great Park, you know, Brian, you like to reference this, and I think you're right on with it, is demographics. It's It's tough to make historical comparisons when the demographics are so strong, whether it be in housing or participation rates of labor. We have a lot of people who are aged out by choice or by age of the labor market, but they're still in that whole kind of aggregate number. So, yeah, I think demographics are really interesting. Um, you know, you're right. There's a big demographic uh, baby boomers that are, you know, reaching retirement age. It's a, just a fact, right? But at the and same we need time, more people working to take care of them <laughs> or provide them services. At the same time, or if, you, if you think about what that boom in the CPI did, uh, it also increased all their social security check payments. <laughs> Good um, point. For, Good point permanently, which was only a temporary phenomenon, right? Because we had 9% unemployment, I mean, 9% inflation. Well, now it's temporary phenomenon, less. yes, but those prices of goods, um, how many will have come down? Uh, will Is it temporary? The changes in prices are arguably probably Some will, not. some won't, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Good point. So, so, some will, some won't. Um, but yes, Chris, you're right. Um, uh, so, you know, th this is a generation that is, doesn't need to, you know, that, that has a lot of wealth that has right. the ability to spend it. They have the, the ability to gift it. Uh, you know, baby boomers are the biggest cohort that are buying houses right now. You would think it would be a younger generation, um, but they've surpassed the millennial generation. Right. A lot of disposable which income, which, which back to where's the recession? You know, did this this baby boom is maybe maybe the reason for all this growth and the the remaining growth in the economy instead so of the, a recession. The Delta CEO gave an interview with uh, CNBC yesterday, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday, and he was talking about how 75 percent of his customers hmm. make over a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And that sector of customers is booming yeah. and they raised guidance for 2023 2024 and i believe 2025 by a lot not by a little and there's this is a very rare thing for for an airline industry right especially three years after probably you know an existential not probably an existential crisis that happened right mm -hmm. um and you and you have to take that and think you know, to me, I, I'm generally skeptical. I think, okay, this guy's being a little bit overly optimistic. How can he possibly know that this demand that he's seeing now is going to last three years? But also part of you says, hey, look, this guy has a lot of data. Um, uh, you know, he's he's not, he's probably basing it off of something. Yeah. Uh, and what is he basing it off of? Well, I think exactly what we're talking about, right? I think business travel is coming back. Um, and I do think people are doing, you know, better than maybe the consensus thought six months ago. And, and I think that was, you know, just to wrap up this whole discussion on where we started. Yep. Well, as, as we do wrap up, uh, for the news, uh, just a moment, I wanted to mention that these kinds of insights, having an understanding of what's really happening with the economy in front of us and how that plays out into your portfolio and how to be positioning your investments. These are all things that we try to pay attention to. And if you would benefit from some of these same kinds of insights, uh, please reach out to us and take advantage of our resources as well. You can connect with us at amrfinancial.com. And as we said before, we do offer a complimentary consultation. Come on in. We'd love to talk to you. We do like to have you bring, gather all your information. We look at it from a holistic perspective, and then we can dig into what's the right portfolio design for you. So amrfinancial.com or give us a call at 508-771-8900.
You're listening to Something More with Chris Boyd, financial talk show. Asset Management Resources, LLC, and J. Christopher Boyd, CFP, provide investment advice on an individual basis to clients only. Proper advice depends on a complete analysis of all facts and circumstances. The information given on this program is in the nature of general financial comments and cannot be relied upon as pertaining to your specific situation. AMR, LLC, cannot guarantee that using the information from this show will generate profits or ensure freedom from loss. Listeners should consult their own financial Financial advisors or conduct their own due diligence before making any financial decisions.